Can you hear the temperature of water? Yes, yes you can. Hello internet, welcome to Food Theory, the show that's hot for cool facts. Now, quick test, listen to this. And now this. Which one was the hot water and which one was the cold water? Many people can actually hear the difference and intuitively tell that pour number one was cold water and pour number two was hot. But how could you tell? It was the same thing, it was just water. And I can tell you that both pours were coming out of the same container and being poured into the same container. Why is your ear doing something that I guess you never told it to do and you maybe even don't even realize that it does? Unless of course you had yourself a really weird upbringing. And the sound of the cow is moo. And the sound of water at 10 degrees Celsius is. And why would my ear be so finely tuned to this very specific thing when most of the time I can't tell the difference between the sound of my cat walking into a room down the hall and a burglar coming to kill me in my sleep? Believe it or not, this first came to my attention when I was doing research, not for this channel, but actually our sister channel, Film Theory. During my research, I came across a fan favorite Sesame Street character, Snuffleupagus, spitting mind-blowing facts in front of a drab gray background while somber piano music played in the background. It was like Werner Herzog was conducting this interview, but nope, it was Vanity Fair the whole time. And right there in the middle of all this existential ennui, Snuffleupagus drops this truth bomb. You can hear the difference between hot and cold water while it is pouring. I had never heard that before. And apparently no one else heard it from this interview since the sad depressing street segment didn't exactly get itself a lot of views. But it did get me curious enough to start investigating. And what I found was that when it comes to things you eat, and in this case drink, your body has taken in a lot more information than you could possibly realize. Being able to tell the difference between the sound of hot and cold water is at the intersection of physics, biology, and your own crazy subconscious. Listen up, friendos, because today we're talking about how your ears are pulling it off and more importantly, why? And then we're gonna put team theorists to the test to see how far you can stretch this superpower. This super power. Super power. Yeah. Still workshopping the puns on this one. In the case of hearing water, your ears fine-tuning to the sound may be fundamental to your survival as a human being. While a lot of the world takes water for granted now, this certainly wasn't the case in the early days of human evolution. The aquatic ape hypothesis is the theory that Homo sapiens, a special brand of ape that we are, evolved based on their ability to stay near bodies of water so they didn't dry out. We as a species are very sensitive to dehydration, and early survival depended on our ability to literally hunt clean water in our environments. We Homo sapiens had to track hidden sources of water through sight, smell, and of course, sound. Honestly, it's the same way our team hunts down theories, desperately, and for the survival of our jobs. Our ability to sense water in so many ways meant that our zillionth great-grandmother didn't die of dehydration, thereby paving the way for us and every last non-flavor of LaCroix. I'm sure this is a proud moment for all our great-great-great-great-great-great ancestors. But still, understanding why we're very evolved to hear water doesn't tell us how our ears are actually doing it. First, what's the difference? between the sound of hot and cold water. We can tell that there's a perceptible difference, but it's hard to actually put a finger on it. When it comes to sound, the biggest difference that we as humans can perceive is pitch. So for this theory, we started by looking at the pitches of hot and cold water. In 2017, an alert internet user named Intelligent Sound Engineering posted this article, where they analyzed the relative pitches of hot and cold water pores to see if they actually produced different notes. They generated a spectrogram, a visualization of sound that lets you see the pitch. If you're an interneter or a fan of our big brother, channel game theory, finding ways to visualize sound is a particular favorite of sneaky ARG makers and horror game programmers, so this stuff is like old hat to you. Intelligent sound engineering's graphs look like this. It's pretty surprising data. You can see that the pitch of water is almost the same for both the hot and cold water pores, cold being the top one and hot being the bottom. The only difference in spectrogram you can see is that weird swoopy bottom line in the cold sample. Turns out that a water pore is multi-tonal, or made up of more than one pitch. And in the cold water sample, it produces a strong lower note. Your ear doesn't wind up hearing two notes at once, it just hears a blending of those two pitches, meaning that the total cold water sound is slightly lower than the hot sample. But why would that be? They're both just water. Why would they possibly be producing different notes? To answer that, we turn to everyone's least favorite 10th grade class, 
chemistry or physics. To be honest, the answer involves both of them, so whichever one was the worst for you, got it covered. But water is always water. Always gonna be H2O. We know intuitively that water does very different things at different temperatures. We know at zero degrees Celsius, it changes to a solid, ice. And we know at 100 degrees Celsius, it changes to a gas, steam. So it makes sense that when water is closer to zero degrees Celsius, it behaves a little more like ice. And when it's closer to 100 degrees Celsius, it behaves a little more like steam. To see that difference though, you're gonna have to look at how water moves and flows within a cup. And I'm talking like molecule levels of close. How fast water flows, or really how fast anything flows, is called viscosity. If you think of something viscous, usually you think of something thick and sticky. Syrup, honey, molasses, when people used molasses back in the day. All things that are thick and slow moving, like me after Thanksgiving dinner. If something has high viscosity, it's slow and hard to pour. Low viscosity is the exact opposite, fast and easy to pour. But then, what is viscosity? Well, at the very basic level, it's how well the molecules in the liquid stick together. More viscous liquids have molecules that resist moving or pouring. They just want to stick together. But we're comparing water to water, right? They're the same molecule. How could they possibly be different? Well, when you heat molecules, they behave differently. In cold water, molecules are moving slower and they have more chances to stick together, hang out, shoot the breeze, and actually line up so their polar ends create a strong lattice that's harder to break. More viscous. On the other hand, when you heat water, the molecules inside move really fast. Like, way too fast to stop and say hello to all the other little molecule friends. No one's sticking together, no one's hanging out, so when you pour that hot water, it's actually easier to move those molecules. There's no friends, there's no attachments. On top of that, any air bubbles that are trapped in the liquid during the pouring process rise to the surface and pop much faster in a thin, low viscosity liquid. Because it's literally easier for bubbles to move through thin liquids instead of trying to get through something viscous where they're gonna get stuck. We don't perceive these sorts of differences as the water pourer. We're just the giant oafs who have no idea about the microscopic forces that are happening inside of our hands. But our ears can actually tell all of this. The difference between hot and cold that you perceive is your ears recognizing a difference in viscosity. Which you gotta admit is pretty incredible in theory. In food theory. But what I want to do is see it in person and test its limits. Just how good are our ears in telling the differences in water temperature. For that, we needed a little less theory and a little more dewy. Luckily, I had a few spare theorists hanging around the house. Opening. Clap. Oh. That was crazy. That was a good one. <laughs> Solid in the zone. Yeah, you'll see, you'll see go, that, shook, that shook the rafters. After deafening all the test subjects by clapping in their ears, I set them to the task of distinguishing between very hot and very cold water. So just to get things started here, I figured let's just test the basic premise. Can you actually hear a difference between two extreme temperatures of water? So what we've got set up here for experiment one is a 200 degree Fahrenheit option and a 50 degree Fahrenheit cold water option. And uh, for all of you international viewers, we brought in Tom from overseas. He can translate that to you. That is 93 degrees Celsius and 10 degrees Celsius. He's like a savant. I don't know how to do this. <laughs> we might have fed him those numbers before we started rolling I mean, cameras. Our system makes way more sense than yours, so. We did eventually pour the water. Which of those two, first or second, would you say was the hot water? All three test subjects immediately identified the sound of hot water, but each of them described what they heard differently. I wasn't really hearing much of a difference in like pitch mm -hmm. or anything as much as I heard like a difference in intensity and like energy. Like the second pour sounded duller hmm. to me, like more, almost more hollow. See, it's interesting because you, you mentioned sort of the dullness of the sound, but for me, it was, you know, I was tuning into the pitch of it and mm -hmm. the second one sounded lower mm -hmm. to me. I don't quite know how that translates, um, <laughs> but I was like, I can tell one is high, one feels higher, mm -hmm. one feels lower. Like Ryder, I actually didn't hear the difference in the pitch. I actually felt like I could tell a difference in texture for lack of a better mm. word. I felt like the second one was smoother and mm -hmm. less chunky and splashy, and for me, I associated that with a warmer temperature. The fact that they could hear something and all tell the difference was boding well for the next step in the theory, differentiating between lots of different temperatures. For this experiment, I actually prepped five different temperatures, both the very hot and very cold temperatures that we used before, plus an additional three in the middle to see if our ears were finely tuned enough to be able to place water temperatures in order from coldest to hottest. The temperatures we tested were five degrees Celsius, 25, 50, 75, and 95 degrees Celsius to see if our ears could distinguish temperatures that were about 20 degrees Celsius of difference. How are you feeling, Steph? I feel really nervous, actually. I, I genuinely feel um, like jittery about this. Food theory is not usually a test for us. 
It's usually a test for like some random TikToker with a terrible recipe, but I really feel in the hot seat on this one. Stephanie wasn't alone. Everyone had similar feelings. That's a lot of pressure. And Ryder, how familiar are you with the sound of water pouring? Vaguely. Mm -hmm. Like I know it if I heard it. <laughs> well, you're gonna hear it a lot. All right, Tom, how you feeling? I am terrified to get this wrong. <laughs> Why? This is a safe space. This is a safe space, okay. Yeah, right, safe space. That's why I set this whole thing up to look like they're sitting there for water torture. Okay, are you ready? I'm ready. This is pour number one. Okay. That sounds cold. Should I be writing things down? <laughs> uh, can I hear one again? Okay. Can I go back to pour number two? Oh, shoot. Throaty. Hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Right. Okay. Honestly, the test subjects actually did better off the bat than I expected. Take me through your thought process. Okay, so f pours four and five both sound cold to me. Pour three sounded, oh, sorry, pour two sounded hot to me. And then the pours one and three felt like they were medium hot. That's where I'm sitting right now. So the very first one had this very like uh, high end splash to it. There was a very, there was a very crisp sound to it. That one was a bit throaty, a bit in the mid range, like ah, ah. The end results though were mixed. Hey. How'd you I do? you did surprisingly well. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. Wait, you, how many did I get right? So, Stephanie. Okay. Yes. You got three right. Okay. Which is, I mean, honestly, really impressive. Which also means that all I did was presumably switch two. Right? Correct. Okay. And and they were the two that were next to each other. Shoot, Ryder has perfect pitch. He's gonna get all of them. He's gonna be the one that beats me. Tom's gonna get none. Tom's not gonna get any. Tom's here. <laughs> That's my prediction. Ryder. I'm counting on you to get them all. Tom, I, I, I have faith that you'll put a point on the board. All right, Ryder. Yo, what's up? You got one. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so you were close with all of your assessments. Cool, I failed. <laughs> you know what? I think we all won because we all learned something today. Ah, uh, nah, nah, I failed. Yeah, you failed. Well, Tom, I have exciting news. Okay. <laughs> We have a first for this competition. Okay, well this is either very good or very, very bad. <laughs> Actually, it's, it's, it's not, you, you, you got one right. Yeah, <laughs> I tied with Ryder. There's a reason I'm doing the law theories on game theory. Really across the board, it was like, let me just throw a bunch of things at a dartboard and maybe some of them will stick. I was trying to listen to pitch. Pitch was not the answer. <laughs> gotta listen to the texture, Tom. Texture, it's, it's water! Even though none of our test subjects correctly identified all five waters in order, since Steph was the closest, we decided to go ahead with one final experiment, identifying three temperatures of water with only 10 degrees Celsius between them. And so, it is down to you, and it is down to me. Ah, uh, Stephanie, we meet again. I am shocked that I made it to this round, actually. I'm, I'm genuinely super surprised and also delighted. So now, for this final round, we're gonna see how precise you can get. This time, we've only narrowed it down to a 10 degrees Celsius gap. So we have three cups. One is 25 degrees Celsius, one is 35 degrees Celsius, and one is 45 degrees Celsius. That seems really hard. It that should be. really difficult. But you know what? I have faith in you. I believe in you. I don't want to let us down. I don't want to let down science. So, without any further ado, because I don't want these to cool off. Okay, let's go. Let's begin. Welcome to 15 minutes Shoot. pouring water. Shoot. How okay. long will people be willing to watch this? Okay. 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 Stephanie has her results. Well, you got one right. Oh, oh so close! Dang it. Oh. So close, you got the coldest. We've definitively shown that there is a limit here. I feel like with practice I could get this. <laughs> 
a very useful skill. I want to try again. Unfortunately, no one volunteered to stay late on a Friday night to pour more water for Steph, so we wrapped the experiment and came away with some interesting results. We as people are exceptionally well-tuned to detect the sound of water, and almost all of us have the innate ability to distinguish between very hot and very cold water. It's an innate ability that we don't even realize that we have. There's even evidence based on our very small sample size that people can actually tell the difference in water that's at least 20 degrees Celsius apart in temperature. Once you get below that though, the sounds aren't really different enough for human ears to detect. The takeaway of all of this is that your ears are able to detect way more than just changes in pitch. They're able to detect the actual texture, quality, and in our case, viscosity of the things in the world around you. Usually the advice on YouTube content is to not try the things that you see on screen at home, but this one you can and absolutely should try at home. During our filming, other people not participating on camera asked if we could run them through the experiment off camera. Honestly, it's super fun. The absolute lamest fun that you can have on a Friday night, which is the type of fun that you know all of us here at Theorist love. So let us know if you can beat our record and tell us your results down in the comments. And as always, remember, it's just a theory. A food theory. Bon appetit. If you thought today's episode was surprising, I am literally just getting started with all the things that your five senses can do with water. Think your body's only superpower is sensing the temperature of water? How about the power to change the flavor of water without adding anything to it? I am 100% serious. This is yet another real live science experiment that you can do yourself at home, thanks to our sponsor for today's episode, Air Up Water Bottles. Ever hear that taste and smell are closely linked? Well, Air Up takes the science that links taste and smell and uses it to create delicious tasting water without adding a single thing to it. Using their incredibly effective, incredibly long-lasting scent rings, your brain is tricked into believing that you're drinking flavored water without any of the actual additives, preservatives, or sugars. When I heard about this, I was pretty skeptical. I'm a man of science. Even though something could work in theory, it doesn't mean that it's gonna work in real life. But this does. In fact, I use Air Up almost every day because I don't like drinking water that doesn't have flavoring, but also when I add flavorings, usually they have like aspartame or artificial sweeteners, stuff that I'm actively drinking water to try and avoid inserting into my daily diet. My daily water intake has skyrocketed thanks to this water bottle. I love their product so much that I'm the one who reached out to them. And here we are. It is wonderful. It's not overpowering. It's a light, easy to drink level of flavor. You can also just pop the scent nozzle down away from your nose and you immediately just revert back to regular unflavored water. The science of all of this is just so cool. I use my air up all the time and I'm excited that they decided to be a sponsor here. So go show them some love and try the most hydrating science experiment that you'll ever do. They actually have a bundle right now that they're calling the Naughty List, which has some very cool flavors attached to it. Orange vanilla, mango passion fruit, and raspberry lemon. Though I gotta say my personal favorite is wild berry from their berry all the way set. Anyway, the bottom line here is that there's something here to make your taste buds happy and to use science to get seriously hydrated this holiday season. Their Black Friday sale actually starts early, so you don't have to wait until after Thanksgiving to get good prices on any of this stuff. Again, I cannot tell you enough how cool I think the Air Up water bottle is, so click the link down in the description below to check them out and see just how crazy our bodies are when it comes to the fluids that we're able to consume. Bottoms up, my friends. I'll see you next week.